In the last video, we have learned how to build a convolutional neural network and we did cover some essential layers that are need for constructing a convolutional neural network, such as the convolutional layers, pooling layers, and also the shallow neural network. However, we still haven't gone through the details and mathematical operations on them. On that note, in this video, we will dive into the convolutional layers, try to understand why and how we can tackle some of the drawbacks of neural network in computer vision aspect and also try to understand its mathematical operations and also the key arguments when we are applying it in the tensorflow carrots let's go ahead and get started we did mention there are some drawbacks of neural network uh, when it's dealing with the image problems the first critical problem is that there are numerous amounts of weights or neurons uh, when we are using neural network to deal with the image problems. You can imagine that um, the neural network use one neuron for each of the inputs. And if we are talking about a 200 by 200 pixel image with three color channels, um, then it's just suddenly blow up to more than uh, hundred thousands of weights that must be trained. It's because we need to flatten the input, flatten the 200 by 200 by 3 picture into a vector uh, before we put everything for training. And therefore, overfitting can easily occur. Let's take a look on this example. If we use neural network to proceed uh, to process and 32 by 32 by 3, image it ends up we will need um, around 200,000 weights for the training uh, again we're using the sequential models and then we continue to use the uh, convolutional um, to these layers maximum pooling to these layers and flatten and dense uh, layers and we just um, create these models um, this is the models of the neural network um, this is the sequential models for the first input layers, uh, just like what I mentioned, we need to uh, flatten the input in order for us to uh, use it for the traditional neural network. So we just flatten the input, uh, which is with the input shapes with 32 by 32 by 3. And then we just um, uh, add two layers. One is the uh, six, one, one of the, one is the dense layer with 64 neurons with the activation function value. And then we have the tens um, classes output with the softmax. Now let's take a look on the summary. Just like what I mentioned, with 32 by 32 by 3, and then with 64 neurons in the first layer, and then 10 neurons at the output layer, you can see that the total parameters is around 200,000. However, with the use of convolutional layers, we manage to reduce it by six by thirty percent around, we end up with uh, around um, uh, one hundred twenty thousand weight. And again, we are going to use a sequential models. We just uh, use a convolution nodes um, to these layers, and then a maximum to these layers, uh, stacking it together uh, with one stack, uh, two stack. And then finally, we again build a convolutional to these, and then we flatten the output. We build a shallow neural network, just like what we've done in the previous example. If you want to know more, please feel free to refer it back to the previous, uh, ex previous video. Now, if we run the cell, you can see that we end up managed to just have around um, one hundred and twenty neurons. In that case. We just reduce around 60,000 60, neurons with the use of the convolutional layers. Therefore, you can see that uh, with the use of the convolutional layers, we significantly reduce the number of neurons needed for training. Now, let's take a look on the other, other, other problems. The other problem is about the translation uh, invariant issue. And other common problem is that neural network reacts differently to the input image and its shifted versions. So that means they are not 
translational invariants. For example, if a picture of a dog appears in the top left of an image, just like the image one, in one picture, and then in the other image, it appears at the bottom right of the of the pictures, just like the image two, the neural network will have different weights. In image one, the green weights will be modified to better recognize the dog. Um, because um, it appears on the, uh, in the top left of the image. That means when we flatten this image, it will appear at the first, um, at the first as the first input. Therefore, the green weights here uh, will be modified to better recognize the dot. However, in image two, the model will try to correct itself at, and the red uh, weight um, because uh, will be modified to better recognize the dot. Because right now the dot is at the is at the bottom right of the bottom right of another image. In that case, the last input will be strengthened or will be used to better recognize the dot. As a result, the approach is not robust and poor for image processing. The third problem is about the spatial information. Uh, when image is flattened in a neural network. The spatial information is locked um, because at the very beginnings, nodes uh, that are closed together are important because they help to define the features of an image. However, after the image uh, flattens into to fit into the new network, that spatial information is lost. For example, the docs has is separated after flattening. Here you can see that the informations about the heads are close together at the very beginnings. However, after we flatten this image, you can see that the dog's heads are actually separated um, in the vector. Therefore, in order to leverage the spatial correlations of the image features, we need another approach. And that approach is just like what we mentioned, that is the convolutional layers approach. With the use of convolutional layers, we can actually perform feature extractions and exclude irrelevant noise. At the same time, we can also reduce the size of the image for faster computations of the weight and improve its generalizations. For instance, the model is to learn how to recognize and dock from a picture with a tree in the background. If a traditional neural network is used, the model will assign a weight to all the pixels, including those from the tree, which is not essential and can mislead the entire network. Instead, a convolutional neural network will use a mathematical technique, namely convolutions, to extract only the most relevant pixels um, in the entire picture. And these techniques allow the network to learn increasingly complex features at each layer. And in this example, it means that uh, with the use of the convolutions, and then we will only recognize the dots instead of the tree. Let's take a look on the process of the convolutions. The convolutions divide the matrix into smaller pieces to learn the most essential element within each pieces. In other words, the convolutions allows the models to learn specified patterns within the image and we'll be able to recognize it everywhere in the pictures no matter it's is um, on the top left of the image or on the bottom right of an image because it just recognized the patterns instead of recognize the locations of that patterns um, convolutions is an element-wise multiplication it will just scan a part of the image a specific a specific part of the image and then usually uh, with a dimensions of three by three windows or with a windows and then multiply it to a filters or a kernel and then the output of the element wise multiplications is called a feature maps and this step is repeated until the entire image is scanned so let's take a look on one of the operations. Convolutions applies a kernels to extract certain features from, from an input image. 
in generals, um, there are two things that uh, you better uh, it's better to remember. First of all, is that uh, normally we use a small size kernels. Yeah, this is a, a preferred uh, uh, over fully connected networks due to the computational causes. In addition, odd size kernels are preferred because it's uh, symmetrically divide the previous layers pixel around the output pixel. Therefore, three by three um, is a very popular choice as an or an optimal choice. So by default, you can just use a three by three kernels to do the convolutions. This graph shows how kernels work for the very first elements. So we have a three by three windows. We just take out these portions, um, just like this. This is a three by three windows. We take out the very first portions, and then we have a kernels. And remember that we are performing a element-wise multiplications. So we have a three by three windows, and then we have a three by three kernels. And then in that case, we are doing the element-wise multiplications. And then we sum it up. And so at the very first, uh, first, first elements, we have a 20s as the features mapped. And of course, depends on the kernel's element values, these kernel element values, a kernels can serve different purposes, such as the edge detection, sub sharpens, or the block spur. And just like this example, if we are having a kernels that that is helping us to detect the edge, it will just return it this picture. And then if we are using a kernel to sharpen the original image, we are getting this image, we are getting this picture. And we we are using a box blur or blurring the image, we are just uh, getting this ima image from the original image. The example here is, is a kernel that helps us to sharpen the image. And also you can check out the code to see how we can set up the kernels to build the edge detections or the box blur. So for example, for the edge detections, uh, it should be, that should be this one. Then it's um, in the first row, it's a negative one, negative one, negative ones. And then in the second row, it's like a negative one, eight, and then negative one. And then in the last row, we are also having a negative one, negative one, negative one. And by using these kernels, and then the the um, the edge can be easily detected. The next things that I want to wanted to show you is the stride. When computing the feature maps, the convolutions windows starts at the upper left corners of the input sensor, and then it will continue to stride or slide it over the all locations, both bottoms and to the right and then until the entire image has been scanned, it will be ended. And sometimes either for computational efficiency or done sampling, the convolutional windows may slide more than one element at a time, skipping their intermediate uh, locations. To determine how many elements it slides for each step, stride is needed. Stride is the number for the pixel shift over the input matrix. Say for example, when the stride is, um, is one, uh, we are going to move the filters to one pixel at a time. And then on the other hand, when the stride is two, that means we are going to move the filters to two pixels at a time and so on. So just take back to previous example, assuming stride equals to one, and then the first step, we are having a three by three windows, we take out these sections and then multiply it by the kernels we get out uh, we get the first um, features and then in the second step because we are using the stride equals one that means the windows will just move one step and then we take out these portions again we use the same kernels and then we calculate the convoluted features value when applying convolutional layers the pixel on the parameters of an image uh, often uh, need to be taking take take care. Um, since we typically use small kernels for any given convolutions, we might only lose a few pixels 
but this can help us reapply many successive convolutional layers. Um, so uh, we need to take care about the edge of an image. One straightforward to this solution to this problem is to add extra pixel around the parameters of an image so as to increase the effective size of an image. Therefore, to better capture those edge or those features close to the parameters. In TensorFlow, uh, when we are talking about paddings, there's two arguments that we can choose that could be one of the valid or same. In this case, valid means low paddings. On, on the other hand, same we sell in padding with zero even it's to the left, right, or up and down of the input, such that the output has the same height and width dimensions as the inputs. Let's take a look on this example. Uh, if we are using the paddings equals to valid, so this is the original image. If we are using the paddings equals to valid, so we are not adding anything around these parameters. And then we will just directly um, do the perform the element-wise multiplications with the kernels and end up with one single element in the convolute features. On the other hand, if we are having the padding equals the same, so it will just pad the zeros around the parameters of this image. And then it will just um, do the element-wise um, element wise multiplications with these kernels, taking these sections and then multiply it by these kernels and then take uh, one another take in another step, take then take these sections and then multiply it by the kernels and then it ends up with the convoluted features. Remember that these outputs has the same height and width dimensions as the inputs uh, if we are using the paddings equals the same. The last arguments that we need to set in the convolutions layers is the activation functions. After computing the features maps, the value here will be transformed via an activation function. Uh, normally, linear activation functions is the simplest activations uh, where no transformation is applied at all. However, it cannot learn the nonlinear mapping functions, and in that case, Linear activation functions are usually used in the output layer of the network that predicts a regression problems. Nonlinear activation functions are preferred as, they, that, as that they allow us to learn more complex features in the data or more complex structure in the data. Traditionally, there are two widely used nonlinear activation functions that include the sigmoid functions and the other one is the 10H function. Let's take a look on the sigmoid functions. Sigmoid functions curve looks like a S curve. Um, the main reasons why we use the sigmoid function is because it exists between zero and one. Therefore, it is particularly useful for models where we have to predict the probability as an output. And since probabilities of anything exist only between the range of zero and one, and therefore, sigmoids is the right choice uh, when we're dealing with a probabilistic problems. The next function is the 10H functions. 10H curves, um, 10H functions also looks like a S shaped. It's also like a logis um, logistic sigmoid. However, the range of the 10H functions now is negative 1 to 1. The advantage is that the negative inputs will be matters strong needs right now matters strong needs negative and the zero inputs is uh, will be mapped near the zeros in the 10h uh, graph instead of the uh, around 0 0.5 at the sigmoid so usually 10h is preferred over the sigmoid function since it's, since it's zero centered and the gradients are not restricted to move in a certain directions that means it can be either to move to a positive direction or the negative, negative directions. A general problem with both the sigmoid and tenic function is that they can be easily saturated. It means that that means that 
uh, with large values, it easily snaps to ones, and with small values, it easily snaps to negative ones for 10h, and of course also for sigmoid functions. Furthermore, the functions are only really sensitive to change once their midpoints, and you can see that the slope is the steepest um, around the midpoints. Uh, so for example, 0 0.5 for the sigmoid and 0 for 10h. And in a very, very deep network, usually it's these nonlinear activation functions will fail to receive useful gradient information because of that. And these problems prevent the deep learning or uh, the deep networks from learning effectively. It's so called vanishing gradients problems. To solve these uh, vanishing gradients problems, especially for deep network, an activation function is needed that looks and act like a linear function, but is in fact a nonlinear function, allowing the complex relationships in the data to be learned by the, the, by the models. A famous function is used at the value, which is a rectified linear activation unit. Values has a shape like this, and they has a gradient one uh, when the input is larger than zero. And then they have the gradient zeros and on the negative side. Thus, multiplying a bunch of values derivatives together in the backprop uh, back equations has a very nice properties of being either one or zero. Therefore, there's no vanishing of the gradient problems at this point. So the gradient travels to the bottom layer either as is or it becomes exactly zero on the way. Let's take a look on the examples to see how we can set up these parameters for the convolutional 2D layer. Keras provides convolutional 1D layers, 2D layers, and also 3D layers. And of course, they are using for different purposes. Say, for example, for convolutional 1D layers, it's mostly used for time series data or natural language processing. And then for the 2Ds, it's mainly used for 2D image data. And for 3Ds, of course, it's mainly used for the 3D image data. In our example, we are using the convolutional 2Ds layers, uh, which is used to create a convolutional kernels um, that is used to produce a tensor of the output. And these tensor of outputs, of course, is the feature maps. Commonly used arguments, just like what I mentioned before, includes the filters, uh, includes the kernel size, and also the strides, paddings, and also activation functions. Uh, let's import the keras models and also import the convolutional to these layers in as an example. Let's assume we have a 32 by 32 RGB image with free color channel. We want to create a 64 filter, 64 filter with a 3x3 three three kernel size, 3x3 three three kernel size, shift one pixel at a time, that means strides um, 1, 1 at a time, and the output has the same height and width dimensions, um, that is the 32 by 32. That means we need to set the paddings equals to same, and also activated by the value and here the activation function we set it as the values since this is the um, first layer we need the input shapes as well and therefore we just um, um, just like what we've done before we need to set up the sequential models and then we add a convolutional to these and then the first parameters is the filter and then the second parameter is the kernel size and then the third parameters is the strides and then the fourth parameters is the paddings and then we also need to add the activation functions as, as well as the input shapes because this is the first input layer and then if we want the cell and we will just get this set up correctly and that's it for this video we just covered the details of the convolutional layers and learned why and how convolutions computations can help us to solve some new networks problems when dealing with the image problems. And then we also introduced 
um, some of the company used the argument for configuring the convolutional layers. In the next video, we will go through the details of pooling layers, which is often added right after the convolutional layers. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.